Good morning. I'm Jacqueline Monteith, science coach with Frontier School Division. I'm here with Glenn Peterson, our wonderful forestry trainer for this morning. Um, welcome to our live stream day uh, for all things Envirothon. So we're starting this morning with a 45 minute training session on forestry. Before we begin though, I would like to give a huge thank you to our Frontier School Division right click team. We have Chris here who's helping us out today. Um, and we also have some people in the room with us um, ready and waiting to help out as we go along today. Um, I guess without further ado, we'll just let you get to it. Great. Thanks, Jacqueline. Well, good morning, everybody. As Jacqueline said, I'm going to, uh, my name is Glenn Peterson. I'm the Envirothon coordinator. I work for the Manitoba Forestry Association. And today I'm going to talk about forestry. And actually not just forestry, we've expanded the topics and now it's native plants in forestry. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And um, I'm going to, first things first, I'm going to go through kind of a little bit of an outline of what we're going to talk today. We're going to talk about forest ecology and some of the things about uh, plant parts and annual growth. We're going to talk some, spend some time talking about species ID and that kind of stuff. We're going to show you how to use a dichotomous key. Uh, we're going to talk about forestry measurements then, why we do measurements, how we determine tree age, how we determine tree diameter, and how we determine tree height. So if, without uh, further ado, I'll get started with that. So if you look at behind me on the screen, you'll see some examples of different leaf shapes, different growth uh, characteristics of trees, different needle forms that uh, conifers have versus uh, uh, different leaf shapes that, uh, that uh, deciduous trees have. So part of, the, um, part of the thing about forestry development is that plants grow in their own uh, niches and established based on their, eco their ecology. So trees like jack pine and trembling aspen and black spruce grow in dense, pure, even age stands because of the nature of their ecology. They need, they're called pioneer species. In that regard, they need open sunlight and clear ground so that they can get established and grow correctly. As opposed to other species like white spruce, balsam poplar, those species actually grow better in an understory in, in slightly shadier conditions um, to get established. So, but then once they've established, if they do get exposed to full sunlight, they can take off and grow a lot better from that. So there's many different types of forest development. Um, most of them have developed, forests have developed in this part of the world anyways, with forest fire as being the major cause of uh, forest disturbance and then resetting the ecological uh, time scale back to zero again. So um, things like other, there are other types of natural disturbances, ice storms, wind storms, um, beaver flooded areas, uh, those types of things which all can affect forest development as well. But by far and, and away, the biggest cause of forest rejuvenation is forest fire. And with things like climate change happening now, and that, that's a good thing about this year's topic on climate change in the north, is that climate change affects not just forestry and native plants, but it affects all of the other topics that we're going to be discussing here today. So it's important for us to realize that the forests are changing. They're changing because of man's influence. They're changing because of natural influences. And now they're natural instances already. And now with the added uh, problems with climate change, they're under that much more stress. They're under stress from invasive pests that are becoming more prevalent. Things like mountain pine beetle, which has very, very much affected the forests on the east slope of the Rocky Mountains. It's moving east uh, into jack pine in Saskatchewan now. It's in the Black Hills of South Dakota. So it's getting close from the from the west. We've had things like emerald ash borer, which we've just found in, in Winnipeg this last year, which was coming from the east. Other things like Asian longhorn beetles. All of those are, are uh, much more prevalent now because of climate change. A, the winters aren't cold enough anymore to kill the, an the, the insects in the plants. Uh, and then so they can become epidemic. And then without forest fires to rejuvenate the population because Smokey the Bear and his message that all fires are bad, which they're really not, all human caused fires potentially can be bad. So Smokey's had a real good effect on the philosophy that, you know, that fires are a natural part of the ecosystem, but man should be very careful about causing those unnatural fires. So that gets us to talk about forest ecology a little bit. And now I'm, that leads me into talking about plant identification. So plant identification is very much important to forestry because as you're going out and surveying, and forestry is a very uh, data dependent uh, uh, um, subject, whereas a lot of data is collected to make sure that people are, that the forests are growing correctly, they're growing at the right rate, and that they're developing as they should normally under normal growing conditions. So things like the tree's height and its age at a specific time, 
the, the density of the species, so how many trees are in any given area, are all important from a forest development perspective to make sure that we're getting forests that are replacing the ones that we're harvesting. In Manitoba, the law is that any forest company that harvests wood has to bring the area back to the same types of species that were there beforehand. That's the law. The forest companies are certified by independent third-party organizations like FSC and the ISA to make sure that they are meeting those obligations of different provincial legislation, the Forest Act, the uh, Forest Health Protection Act, and, some, and the Environment Act. So those are very important to make sure the companies are meeting their obligations because they have been tasked with, um, with t taking responsibility for land management away from the provincial government as terms of their license. So it's very important that companies in Manitoba in the, in, are keeping track of the development of those forests that companies have planted. So after five years, a survey is done called a regeneration survey where they go and count the number of trees that are growing in any area and make projections from that. Then at age 14 and at 10 years later, they do another survey called the free to grow survey where they make sure that the trees that are now growing the, are, are able to survive to the rotation age. So the rotation age is the age that where the trees are starting to decline, much like, uh, like old age in people, they start to, they start to have more uh, health problems. They have insects that are attacking them. They can't fight off those insects. They have disease conditions in some cases and they're not strong enough or vigorous enough anymore to fight those off. Those are the trees that are susceptible to fire, but they also cause insects and disease infestations to build up. So it's very important that trees are harvested before they get to that point so they're not having a negative impact on the next generation. So to do, do tree identification, it's very important that you learn some of the basic tree terms, things such as the terminal bud on a branch, things like bud scales and lateral buds, uh, things like lenticels, which are small little bumps on the tree bark, which allow oxygen to be moved back and forth. Um, also things like uh, the distance um, between uh, annual growth of trees. So we're gonna show you a little bit of that today with some of the samples that we have on the table. Um, and here's some, some uh, more better uh, photographic representation of buds. So the, bu the terminal bud is the bud that's on the end of a branch. So if you're gonna be doing forest identification, it's very uh, likely that you're gonna have things like field guides in your pocket. Field guides are things like the, native, the guide to native plants in Manitoba and also um, things like those uh, field guides there, so plants of the western boreal forest, uh, edible uh, and medicinal plants in Canada. There's lots of field guides that are developed, so it's not, we don't expect anybody to memorize all of the different native species in, in Manitoba and stuff, but it's important to l learn the terms so that when you use things like field guides or dichotomous keys, that you actually can uh, simply and uh, positively identify things. So um, I was reading an article the other day, and for example, in Brazil, there's 8,714 tree different tree species in the country of Brazil. In Manitoba, there's 24. So it just gives you some difference of the, how diverse the forests are in, in, in uh, Brazil versus how diverse they are in Manitoba. But the forest ecology is every bit as, as vibrant. There's lots of animals and plants that are, that are um, integ integrated with the forests that grow there. There's lots of uh, uh, different wildlife species, different insect species, and bird species that are all interdependent on the forest growth and the types of species that grow there. That's why you'll see as forest, young forests grow, certain animals and plants move in there very quickly when they first start, but after a while, after the forests start to develop, those animals and plants change. You may have white-tailed deer and moose that are in an early, early succession stage of a cutover, but after the trees get bigger and larger and they've shaded out all of the herbaceous growth, the moose and others move out and things like caribou and other things, white-tailed deer and stuff move in and start to, to utilize those same areas. So it's very important for us to keep track of how those forests are developing. Wildlife managers and all those people all want to know how the forests are developing as well from their perspective, from their topics or, or resource perspective. So it's important again for you to, do, to learn kind of some of the basic terms like what's a bud, uh, what's a you know, this is a, there's two types of uh, leaf arrangements on deciduous trees. There's opposite and there's alternate. So alternate is the leaves are on opposite sides of the branch as they go up. Opposite means they're opposite. So every place that a leaf comes off of a stem, there's another leaf that comes off at exactly the same place. Good example of that is this green ash symbol here where you can see that the stem comes up and then where, where there's a branch attached, two branches come off at the same spot. Some cases the branch dies, but you can see a remnant of where it was. So that's opposite. 
versus something like this pine tree where you can see where these, are, these branches are, are alternate. This one comes off here, this one comes off here, this one comes off here. So it's important to learn that tech terminology. Likewise, on other types of leaf types on deciduous trees, you've got simple leaves, which are just one blade, versus compound leaves, which have a m number of smaller leaves all attached to a central stalk. So certain species like green ash have those types, other ones like trembling aspen have this type. Then there's other types of compound leaves as well. You can see there's, there's a, a pinnately compound, which is they're exactly opposite each other. There's palmately, so it kind of looks like your hand. And then there's others that are both. There's, so they're, they're, they both come off on, a small, on small opposite stems and then they're all clustered around, around a, a central stalk. And then things like simple leaves like trembling aspen or large tooth aspen are very basic. They cut a single leaf that comes off a stalk of the tree in various places. So it's important to, real, to recognize that in Manitoba, because we have winter for, well, this year it seems like 12 months a year, but typically seven or eight months a year, it's important for us to be able to identify plants, not just by their twigs and leaves that they have in the summer, but also how we can identify them just based on the bare sticks in the winter so, so that you can still do that kind of identification. So we'll start to, I'm start to describe and, and use a dichotomous key and we'll, we'll key out a plant and figure and show you how, the, how a key works. So for those of you that are familiar with the, the Native Field Guide to Manitoba, it has a nice, uh, and here's an example of it. These ones we've got plasticized to use on field tests so in case it's raining or snowing. So there's two types of, uh, of keys included in this book. There's one called a guide to twig based on their winter twigs. So that's a, the one that you would use for uh, deciduous trees at this time of the year before they've leafed out. And then there's another one called guide to trees based on their leaves. So that one you can use in the winter for conifers, but also in the summer for trees that have, they're fully, they're fully leaved. So let's do one based on their, on their leaves. We'll do that one. So if you look at the, at the guide, the first thing is, can you, can you see that? Bear with us for a sec while we get it. Well, we get it uh, identified. So the first choice in this is leaves or needles or scale-like. So for example, if you look at this example here, you can see that those needles are, if you look like they're needle-like as opposed to scale-like. Scale-like is something like this one here, where it's very, looks, uh, there's not really any differentiation. There's no real needles, but they are coniferous. So they have uh, green uh, foliage in the winter. So the first choice is needles are, are scale-like or needle-like. So they are needle-like. If we're using this one as an example, I'm just gonna hang it over the lid here so you can see it. Okay, so the leaves are needle-like or they're scale-like? Well, they're needle-like. So you go down this side, now you're starting to go down, it's dichotomous keys are yes or no answers. So it's either yes or no. So are they scale-like or are they needle-like? Well, they're, they're not ne scale-like, they're needle-like. So you're gonna go down this side of the chart now. So the next choice after needle length is there, are they singly on a branch or are they look in clusters? So if you look at this one carefully, and I'll pull one needle off, you can see that those needles are attached together and they're in a pair on the, on the, uh, on the tree, on the branch itself. As opposed to this spruce tree here, you can see, and these ones, they're obviously single. They just come off the, uh, off the branch in one place. So that's the difference between single and and one of the uh, cute little uh, phrases that, that we try to remember is spruce are single, pines are plural. So if, that's, so if you've got a, a tree that has multiple needles in a bunch, that's a pine typically. Eastern white pine has five needles per bundle, but all of the other ones, red pine, jack pine, ponderosa pine, all have two per bundle. So, Okay, so now you're, there's, they're uh, in clusters. So are the clusters of two to ten? Yes, there's two in there. So now you're moving down here to this side. So are they in clusters of two or are they in clusters of five or more? So again, we're in the clusters of two. So are they four inches or longer or are they under two inches? So this one, of course, I picked a sample that is kind of right on the borderline. So, but I would say these are about two inches or longer, to, uh, just under two inches. So this is jack pine. So that's the, how it, simple it is to walk that through. So, I mean, some of the species, because there's only 24 species in Manitoba, you should be able to identify all 24 species very quickly after a little bit of time, and that'll save your time, yourself from flipping back and forth through these books. 
Now the other thing you can do is once you have identified it to Jack Pine, you can flip to the individual page in the book there and just use the other information that they have to just help you make sure that your diagnosis is correct. Look for cones. Do you see cones uh, around the tree? Like Jack Pine have serotonous cones that only open up after forest fires. So do you see examples of that? Do you see examples of the bark that you can look at? So all those types of things, it's almost like CSI. You, you've, you've narrowed down what you think it is, but then uh, graphically you've got to go and actually look. You look where it's growing. You don't expect to see Jack Pine growing in black spruce bogs. So you're already kind of past that stage. You can you've confirm it to be Jack Pine. The other thing, so for example, um, uh, other species that have different types of bark, everybody knows uh, paper birch or uh, white birch. So some of the things that you can tell uh, very quickly without, on the tree without even having to go through the whole dichotomous key thing. You look at the tree, you see it's got uh, leafy uh, or a scaly type of bark that peels off very easily. So there's a good example of birch. So you don't have to go any further with the key to identify that. You can make sure of it by looking on the white birch page in the, in the guide, but that'll be typically what you would, uh, how do you would follow that process out. So we're going to do another one here. I'll do two or three before we get into the next part of the topic. So this is a tree that's very unique and it is, we're going to walk this one through right from the start. I'm going to hang this one here as well on my overhead, on my, my prop. So there's one species in Manitoba that, uh, one coniferous species that loses its needles every winter. You probably know what that is, but we're going to walk through the key on that one as well. So this one we're going to use the guide for the, twi for the winter twigs because of course there's no leaves on it. All right, so look, make sure that we're looking at these types of things as well as any other pictures they have in, inside this guide is also uh, the same kind of illustrated terms uh, that we see on these uh, on these things they have in front of you here. So just again, you can use this guide and these illustrated terms to help you. So first thing for winter twigs, are the buds opposite or the buds alternate? Well, you can see on this thing, there are some that are opposite, but generally, if you look at the growth form, they're alternate. They grow off at different places on the stem and they grow off at various angles and stuff. So there's no consistent pattern where everything is across from each other. So that's buds opposite, or buds alternate, excuse me. So then the next question you look at, are there spurs on the twigs or not? Spurs are those small little peg-like structures that you can see sticking out of the stem there on a tree. And you could, if you look in the, in the field guide, you can see that, there's, that they're marked and there's an example of it uh, uh, diagram, diagrammatically. So, so the next, so that choice was they're on pegs. And it's tamarack. So that's as simple as that one was. There's only one species in Manitoba that has alternate branching and spurs on the twig, and that's tamarack. So this is a deciduous conifer. You can see a picture of it right here, this yellow one. It actually turns yellow in the fall, and the needles all fall off, and then it grows again every year. So we've had lots of stories where people have come in and said, my neighbor just brought a property right beside us, and all his tamarack, he cut them all down thinking they were dead. Well, they weren't dead. They just, it was in the winter, and they didn't have needles on them. So um, tamarack is a very important species in Manitoba. It's the primary habitat where uh, great gray owls nest is in tamarack forests. It's another pioneer species, as I said, with black spruce and jack pine, where it's one of the first species to grow after disturbance or harvest. And its seeds will also live in the forest floor and litter for hundreds of years. So they can, as soon as the areas are harvested, it's ready to go. All right, so we'll do one more field guide with a twig again just so that you make sure that you're following me along here. So again, winter twigs, important in Manitoba because of course we're in winter half the time here, it seems like. So are the buds opposite oh, I got or the buds alternate? The buds are opposite. You can see they come off exactly the same place here. You can see there's small little buds, there are little scars where another branch came off here. So it was obviously all opposite, but it, this sample just because of wear and tear and and where, it's, uh, where it was growing has probably been abused a little bit. It was a boulevard tree by my office, so it said snow blowers and everything run into it. So it's not typical, but again, it'll give you, the it'll give you kind of some of, the, um, some of the characteristics we're looking for. So the buds are opposite or the buds are alternate? Well, we've already determined that because of that that they're opposite. So then the next question is, and I'm sure the camera is not going to be able to pick this up, but are the, buds ha are the twigs hairy? 
or not hairy. Now you can't really use older trees than, uh, or old um, brand new growth because it won't be exhibiting the growth characteristics. But this one is not hairy. There's no hairs along the branch. They're smooth as anything. They have a few lenticels on them, these small little bumps. But there's no real ha hairs on them. So if the twigs are not hairy, then you look at the buds. So, the, so on the dichotomous key, we're at buds opposite. Twigs are not hairy. So then you've got the two choices. Are the buds black or the buds rusty brown? If you can see in the picture here, the buds are rusty brown, green ash. So you've got so you end up at green ash. So again, that's as simple as it is. In fact, this one was only three steps, um, and that's all just based on the few growth characteristics. So, oh my time. So we've got trees identified by species as we're going out and collecting data. The next thing we maybe need to do is collect information about how how old the tree is. So there's a number of ways that we can identify tree age. Uh, one of them is using this uh, piece of equipment. This piece of equipment is called an increment core, and it actually drills right into the tree, and you extract a long a cylindrical uh, core from the tree that has the growth rings on it. So, and then you can count those growth rings. So this is very uh, easy to carry in your in your uh, forester's vest. Uh, you pull it out and use it at any site, and then you can actually take the the tree cores back to the lab in a McDonald's. We used to send our crews out and make sure they stopped at McDonald's on their way out of town. I got a bunch of drinking straws because the the uh, the tree uh, uh, cylinders, the cylinders fit right into them, and you can staple each end. And with a sharpie, you can mark on the st straw where you collected it and what date, so that you've got actual accurate information about the information you collected. And it's way easier to count those rings back in the lab than it is in the in deep in the woods where there's black flies and mosquitoes and bears chasing you and all that kind of stuff. So very important, and it's very important from a research perspective that those. Um, in some cases where tree ring growth is very close together, uh, you actually have to use a dissecting microscope or something else in the lab to be able to actually age, uh, actu accurately age the tree. But you don't actually, and this is the other advantage of increment core is it's, it's non-destructive. It won't kill the tree. All you're doing is extracting a small little plug out of the tree. And if the tree is growing and vigorous and healthy, it's able to close that wound with sap and no pests or diseases will be able to get into it that way. The other way that you can age trees is just by counting the growth rings on a thing called a tree cookie. Not this nice sugar tree cookie that Jacqueline made for us today, but an actual tree cookie like this one, which is, uh, so if you can look at that, it's, you can see that the growth rings are very close together on this tree. This is a black spruce that was harvested in southern Manitoba. And it's very, you can, so to count the growth rings on this, the, the way a tree grows, it puts on a ring of growth every year from its cambium. And the cambium is the actual growing part of the tree right under the inner bark, and it lays down two types of cells every year. In the spring and summer, when it's rapidly growing, it lays down wide, large cells, and those create the white part of the tree ring. In the fall, when growth slows down and it starts to get ready for winter, it puts on late wood, which is the black ring. So each, each year's growth is two, is one white ring and one black ring. So the easiest way to do it is actually just count the black rings or white, whatever, whatever the case may be. Some cases you may need a magnifying glass to determine the detail. And also typically you need some kind of pointer like a straw or a toothpick to keep track of uh, as you go across the ring so that you can count it. So it's very important to know, for example, how trees, how, how old trees are because you then you can determine whether they're actually starting to slow down in their growth and whether they is now they're a good candidate to be harvested. So um, some trees you can tell a lot by the growth rings. You can see this one here was a, is a very good example. It's only about 20 years old, but you see it had huge, like judging by the, the width of the growth rings here, had very, very rapid growth at the be in initial part of its life but then very slow rings in the last 10 years. So that may be due to climatic factors, that may be due to, to having too much competition. All of its neighbors have now grown up and caught up to it, so it's starting to get shaded by its competition. So you can tell a lot of things by analyzing growth ring patterns. It's a subject called dendrochronology, 
where you can track back through ancient old buildings and, and old wood. You can get uh, uh, sequences of uh, tree rings that tell you, and when you link those up to climate events and you know uh, cold periods and that kind of stuff, you can see that in the growth rings themselves. And that's very important because you can, those are actually nice living laboratories that show the effects that climate change is having on tree growth. Okay, so we got trees growing, we've got them, we've measured them, we've, we, so we know how old they are, we know what species they are. We also have to know a few other things to be able to calculate how much wood is in there. It's, it, unfortunately, still forestry is about harvesting wood for all the products that we use, whether it's toilet paper, or paper towel, or reading paper, or the material that we're, these books are printed on. Very important for us to know tree volume. So um, picture a tree as growing as this one here is growing up, it grows kind of like a cylinder. It grows straight up from the ground, and, or in some cases the tree grows like a, like a cone because it's very, uh, there's a lot of taper to the tree stem. Think of a, uh, a Christmas tree. It starts at a large base but ends up at a small point, so the tree is actually growing like a cylinder. So there's an equation, and you, all you folks that are really good at math know what the volume of a cylinder is versus the volume of a cone. And because we've done forestry in Manitoba for a couple hundred years, We've collected thousands and thousands and thousands of records of tree characteristics, so age, height, diameter, that we've now put into databases. And we've used those numbers to modify our volume equations so that we're trying to, as accurately as possible, measure how much wood is in any given area. So a forestry company or anybody else that's going into harvest has a good idea of how much wood is there before they get there. They know how much money, for example, it's going to cost to put the road in to get in there, any stream crossings that they have to do. So it's very important from their perspective to know what's in there to begin with. Also because the trees that are there to begin with are also going to determine what types of trees you should plant there. So if, for example, if it's a black spruce area that they've cut black spruce for pulp, you're not going to go in and plant a tree species that grows in jack, like jack pine that grows in sandy or uh, rocky areas. So silviculture is the growing and tending of forests. And it's all very much based on the tree ecology as we first started talking about. So we've got the tree uh, volume, tree diameter, and we can measure that with something called a diameter tape. This is a diameter tape, and it's actually because foresters hate math and they love being out in the woods. And all of their equipment that they use, uh, if it's based on uh, ma mathematical principles, are built into the testing equipment. So this diameter tape has two sides on it. One side is just a measuring tape that measures that measures distance that you can use for anything. On the other side, it says diameter in centimeters. So this measurement is actually going to calculate the circumference of the tree and then convert that to diameter. So if I can use myself as an example, you, there's a standard height that you measure all trees at for forestry purposes, and that's the diameter at breast height. It's 4.5 feet or 1.3 meters above the ground. So you put the, uh, the diameter tape, you put it around the tree at breast height, make sure that's level and parallel to the ground, and then pull it tight. And you can see that, and you read the number that's right over the zero. So, so this one, if you look at it, now I'm gonna breathe out so I look even bigger. So this one is 29 centimeters. Now the reason that it has to be, in, that it has to be the diameter is because the volume equation doesn't include circumference, it's, it's diameter times, or one half diameter times height, or whatever it is. I'm, I don't know either, but, so it's important that this be used accurately. It does, it takes into account any of the, in, any of the um, um, you know, irregularities in the tree bark, but it's also important to me that it's parallel to the ground. If you were to do it this way, you could see that it's not level anymore, and it also would, so it would overestimate the diameter. One of the other reasons it's important to measure at a, at a standard height every time is because the next time a crew goes in there in five years, if it's a permanent sample plot where we're judging tree growth on a regular basis, it's important for the next group to calculate the diameter at exactly the same height. If they were to calculate it lower because of the tree taper, it would give you a different, it would, oh, your trees actually got smaller if they moved it higher up the tree over the last five years, even though you know it's been growing. So it's very important to collect the correct information some of the most of our crews now carry data loggers with them where they actually record the information age height and diameter on the trees but it also built in data dictionaries and those types of things and and uh, so you can't for example if you're in a permanent sample plot you can't enter a diameter that's smaller than the last measurement just it's a kind of a fail safe you'd hate to have to go back into the woods again 
in two weeks because you got back to the office and you hadn't collected the right kind of information. So that's diameter. They've got age. The last, the last thing is height. So the, you need to know the height. This is an instrument called a clinometer. It's used for height, but you can also use it to calculate slope. You can actually use it to calculate a number of things. Um, if you go on the, uh, the Envirothon forestry or native plants and forestry um, resource page, there's a thing called forestry equipment demonstrations where this is, these, all these techniques are, are written out for you. But you can also refer to our, our Think Trees MFA YouTube channel. We have a number of different, uh, um, a small seven minute videos of these different techniques as well, how to age a tree, how to diameter a tree. So go there as well and just refresh yourself, make sure that you're following the right techniques for that. So this uh, instrument has an eye hole in it, which has a line inside it, and it has a scale. So you look at the top of the tree and you read the number off the scale. You look at the bottom of the tree and you read off the number of the scale through the eye, and then you add those two numbers together. <clears throat> Very important that you do that technique as properly as well. This, uh, this uh, instrument uses the Pythagorean theory to calculate tree heights by the, the height or the, the two right angle triangles. So again, foresters hate math, so they want Pythagoras built into these things. So once you read those two numbers off, that's the height of the tree. If you're 15 meters away from the tree, you're doing the, this, this equipment is going to calculate the height in meters. If you're 15 feet, it's going to calculate it in feet. So it's, a, it's a scale independent. It's very handy. It fits in your pocket. It has no moving parts other than this little wheel, so it doesn't have batteries that can go bad in the winter. So all of these forestry equipment, the other thing that's important is that a lot of the forestry areas are inaccessible in the summer. They're swamps, they're you know, creeks to cross and stuff. So a lot of forestry surveying gets done in the winter. It's important to have robust equipment that can handle being at minus 40 without ruining a lot of the things like, uh, like GPS units and those types of things. The batteries don't work when it gets past minus 20. So if you have to have, always have opening your jacket up to put your thing in there to keep it warm, it doesn't work so well. So. So it's important and all these things have nice little red strings on them so that you can tie them onto yourself because they, they, they fall out of your pockets when you're walking through dense bush. No doubt about that. Oh, I got my 10 minute warning. So again, refer to the YouTube channel and stuff for um, the actual techniques. There's also on, uh, on other YouTube and, and Facebook and stuff now, there's lots of every, every manufacturer has a, has a video on how to use their products. So, Again, refer to that, use the resources that are available to you. So that's tree height. And you can use that for anything. You can use that to calculate the height of a telephone pole or a building or anything like that. So it's very useful, user-friendly piece of equipment. So we've got native trees, we've got that. Um, one of the other uh, good field guides are some of these ones here, um, which help you identify not only native plants, but uh, na native trees, and there's a small section on them, but all of the other plants, the indicator plants. So um, part of the thing about uh, forest ecosystem development is that it's not only the tree species that you can get some idea of what's growing, but also the understory plants. So what's growing on the ground level under certain tree canopies will tell you a lot about the soil conditions. If there's certain, so certain plants growing underneath poplar, it's probably a wetter site. If there's other ones like uh, rose or uh, hazel and that kind of stuff, it's probably a drier site. So it's not just the trees themselves that create the types of forest, but it's also because of the soil moisture and the soil, uh, soil water things, the type of uh, soil base material, that all has an effect on the types of plants that grow there and the forest development. If the area is very uh, prone to flooding, for example, like along the uh, Assiniboine or Red River Valley, those river bottom forests are subject to annual flooding and that shows up in their growth form, but it also um, it shows how important certain trees are to th doing things like stabilizing riverbanks, stabilizing buffer zones along rivers. Those trees have evolved to grow in those types of conditions where they don't have fire as their major uh, way to be disturbed. It's, it's either floods, it's beavers that cut them down or whatever. So forest development is very important and silviculture has allowed us to determine what species grow best in what given areas. Um, I don't think I got a whole lot more. So
So uh, one of the other things that we do try to talk about in forestry is traditional ecological knowledge. Um, we have a, a lot of First Nations communities that have developed over the years and have got um, a lot of scientific knowledge uh, that they've gathered from collecting information, collecting plants and stuff. So it's important for us to take into account those types of considerations when we're doing land management and those types of things because um, how those types of uh, relationships occur and how uh, First Nations use the landscape and use the plants and stuff is very important and we can learn lessons from that as we try to develop better uh, management plans using locals, uh, local knowledge and local input to make sure that the plans that are being developed by these big forestry companies are actually appropriate for any given area so that they're respecting traditional use, that they're respecting um, the, the types of plants that grow there and the seasonality of that kind of stuff. So that's about where I'm at. Thank you very much for your time this morning and good luck in the regionals. Thank you, Glenn. Um, as Glenn mentioned, good luck in your regional events. Um, we're all excited to see you over the next couple of weeks. Uh, if you do have questions, be sure to contact your advisor. Your advisor can contact us. Um, and moving forward, we'll be seeing you very soon. Thank and you Frontier again. School Division will post these on their website as well, so they stay, uh, stay online for af after this for your benefit if you need to study them later. You bet. Thanks, Jacqueline. Thanks, Glenn.